losing focus and just having gift, been given the word here again, paying attention to it, it is easy to say, it's easier to hear the word. Starting in just a few seconds. Second hand strikes half hour. Can you hear us all right with this mic? Is it getting up all right? Not really. Uh, hold it. Hold it close. Oh, hold it close. Okay. Well, let's get started. I'm privileged. I seriously mean that. I'm privileged today to introduce a group of three illustrious folks, two of whom are competent, and one of whom works for me. I <laughs> 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 can't get no respect. <laughs> You'll notice in the program that there was a change, and it turns out that as part of the 50th anniversary, Joe Harless had agreed to come to the conference for the first time basically in 15 years. And they put him in direct time competition with Carl. And that was like taking Jesus and Moses and saying, let's have a listen to Where do you want to go? You know, I mean, it just didn't make a whole lot of sense. So we decided it made more sense to bring them together and uh, let them share. Uh, particularly because, as Carl will tell you in a few minutes, uh, sort of his profession, as was Al's and mine, were significantly influenced by Joe and his tutelage and mentoring. Um, and I'll start off just giving you a snippet of that. In the early 80s, I had left the work I was doing and joined a consulting firm and went to a small company as a client called General Motors. They were in the process of infusing $55 billion of new manufacturing technology into their plants. And back then, that was a lot of money. That's 25 years, 20, or 20 years ago, okay? And I got hired to help them look at the technology transfer issues and the change issues associated with that investment. And what we did for the first several months is benchmark. Now, I loved human learning, that was my background. I thought the answer to a lot of the performance problems we faced were to get information into people's heads faster and quicker. And so we started benchmarking world-class technical training organizations. We went to the Johnson Space Flight Center, we went to airline pilot training locations, anybody that was seen as world-class. And somehow, perhaps by error, they included Joe's job aids workshop <laughs> in the benchmarking process. <laughs> so, and I went down to Atlanta, Georgia, and attended a, uh, I think it was two, two and a half day workshop back then on job aids design. And it was like a two by four across the side of my head. Where I was totally dissuaded from the idea that getting information into people's heads was the solution or even a primary solution to improving performance. And uh, later on, he actually got me to start to think about accomplishments versus behaviors. And so he's been a, a tremendous influence professionally in my life over the years, and also I like to think of as a good friend. Well, Joe founded the Harness Performance Guild in 1960. No. Oh, no, 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 1990. I'm sorry. I was wrong. He wrote this. Don't let him pull your this. This is it. Anyway, he started the Harlow's Performance Guild in 1960. And, uh, well, the late 60s. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, you, you are. You're, you're correct. <laughs> On rare occasions. This is a good friend of mine. I mean, it's not what my enemies do. <laughs> but the interesting thing, they, they provided services to a lot, a lot of major organizations. But from there have come four past presidents of ISPI, from that company, people who at one point or another worked for Joe. He was president of ISPI in the uh, 1970s, and then he was the first recipient of the Gilbert Award. And the most recent recipient is sitting right next to him. So <laughs> it's unusual that we'd have two Gilbert Award winners on the Diaz together, so that's kind of Fun. He also was 
inaugurated into the HRD Hall of Fame, which is one of three ISPIers who had that honor bestowed on him. His book, and this session is named The Legacy of Joe Harless, and it's based on his seminal work, An Ounce of Analysis, where the phrase front-end analysis was originally coined. And uh, now we wouldn't think about doing project work without doing that kind of work up front, but at the time, it was revolutionary. <coughs> and uh, he went on to produce what I think is one of the most powerful tools ever designed and developed, the accomplishment-based curriculum development model and all the uh, uh, associated job aids. Um, and that received the out outstanding new performance system from, by ISPI. Then later he wrote a book called The Eden Conspiracy, if I asked for hands, not many of you would raise them, but it's one of the most powerful books on educational reformation I've ever seen. And then he had the opportunity to, to implement those principles and concepts in the school in Georgia where he lives, and I'm sure he'll talk about that also. And that school was selected by the Gates Foundation as one of the 30 most impressive models of education in the United States. So that's Joe. Now let's get on to the important folks. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, next in the presentation will be Al Folsom. He does work for me, but he is competent, in spite of my earlier comments. Yeah. <laughs> and is competent. Uh, Al retired after 28 years with the U.S. Coast Guard, where his last position was running the uh, training and workforce performance organization, Coast Guard wide. He's been with Exemplary Performance for four years, did his PhD at Penn State, and we don't hold that against him. <laughs> uh, and he's just a great colleague and a, a, a tremendous asset in all seriousness to the company. And then in between Joe and Al, but who will follow Al in, in sequence, is Carl Binder. Uh, we heard about Carl last night when he was given the Gilbert Award, so I'll try not to be too redundant. Uh, he was heavily influenced as a young graduate student by B.F. Skinner and then a few years later with, impacted by uh, Tom Gilbert and then uh, perhaps in some ways his most recent mentor was Joe. So I think the three of us up here in addition to Joe were all significantly influenced in our entire professional careers by the opportunity to collaborate with him. And with that, I'll turn it over to Joe. <clears throat> Can I see a show of hands of the people who consider themselves newcomers to our field? Oh, excellent. <clears throat> because this uh, presentation uh, that I'm doing is very general. But uh, I, I want to address you primarily. So thank you. I see a bunch of old friends in here and, and some old enemies. <laughs> <laughs> you guys can just get lost. <laughs> <laughs> so for the first part of this uh, will we'll be addressed to news com newcomers. Uh, you know, in the dawn age of our field, which uh, was in the 60s, uh, we were a, a very, I don't know, epicentric, I think is the word lot. I think we were the breeding stock, uh, so to speak, for a, uh, a small cadre of revolutionaries bent on the revolution and the overthrow of the training and educational establishments. That was a dramatic pause I just did. <laughs> <laughs> now, it was not in those days the violent uh, march on the Capitol with pitchforks uh, type of uh, uh, revolution, but we were armed. We, we thought what counted with some data and some uh, and some science. I think under the influence now, as certainly you old timers know, uh, under the influence of B.F. Skinner, our first revolutionary gambit was an attempt to uh, introduce uh, program learning into training and educational organizations. Now. You'll recall, those of you who've been around, we did a fair job of that. 
in, in a number of organizations, but by no means uh, on any kind of a scale did we precipitate a revolution in uh, training and education. However, I think it was important because we show with program learning that learning is lawful when you read Dr. Binder, and that we can knock the heck out of the uh, bell-shaped uh, curve. Now, with the recent uh, advent of e-learning and distance learning and, and all that, I predicted that program instruction uh, would make a big time comeback. But such has not happened yet. And the few contemporary pieces of program instruction I've seen are pretty dreadful. So those of you who are still business, boy, there's a market for you. So I'm hereby saying, let's change the name of our organization, the National Society. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, even in the heyday of program learning, in the 60s, there were some of us who were arguing uh, that we should be about developing an instructional technology, not just program instruction, if we truly wanted to revolutionize uh, uh, training and education. We attempted in those days to enlarge the uh, NSPI to a broader concern of instruction in general, and not just on the narrow uh, uh, emphasis on one medium. Uh, in those days, there was a NSPI conferences. There was a growing number of sessions, I think in the late 60s, dealing with the technology or the process uh, of instruction. We saw a plethora of instructional technology model manifest. For example, how many of you have heard the term methetics? Oh, very good. You're a sophisticated audience. Uh, methetics was uh, Tom Gilbert's very brilliant uh, uh, model for instructional technology. Uh, Instructional systems development was developed at Florida State, right, Roger? And uh, uh, someone, past president of ISBI, uh, Harry Shoemaker, developed the training development standards for, for AT&T. And in more recent times, uh, I developed the accomplishment-based curriculum development system, uh, which was an instructional uh, system. And I think Al and Paul will talk about uh, that in a few minutes. But you know, not willing to uh, let <clears throat> uh, good enough alone, there were some of us who were then arguing that we should be about the development of what? Performance, Performance technology that would subsume instructional technology and have as its process at the beginning a process that was like medical diagnosis. I called my version of a diagnostic process from an analysis. Roger Kaufman, Roger, wave your hand here. Roger Kaufman turned his, turned his approach, if you've been to any of his excellent sessions, a needs assessment, roughly similar to my diagnostic from an analysis. Others such as Tom Gilbert, Gary Rummer, Robert Mager, used the term performance analysis. To me, then, front-end analysis needs assessment was the link between instructional technology and performance technology. The genesis of my front-end analysis was the confounding realization that many of the training developed, training uh, that we developed uh, for our clients didn't seem to make any difference in the on-the-job situation. Even after the trainees, the learners, successfully acquired the knowledge we so carefully taught them. I don't know, a rough analogy, I suppose, is that, is that we gave them good medicine, but it didn't cure the disease. At our own consulting firm, the Hollis Performance Guild, uh, we conducted follow-up investigations with the aid of some of our cooperative clients, such as AT&T, uh, Eastman Kodak, the Centers for Disease Control, the United States Forest Service, and others. In a shocking number of cases, we found that the lack of skills and knowledge was not the predominant cause of the non-job performing situations or problems that our clients were facing. Thus, all the training in the world would do little to help the performance. By now, you know examples of the causes that are not directly amenable to a training solution. I hear some in no particular order. We can talk about that first one all day. 
and uh, I wish Dr. Clark had talked a little bit more about the feedback business. Uh, in no particular order, these are listed. However, I think I've read some data that the lack of feedback turns out to be one of the more, more frequent uh, uh, causes that front analysis have found. In the little book, An Ounce of Analysis, published in uh, 1970, uh, I outlined uh, diagnostic front end analysis. An ounce was a summary at that time of our performance problem solving workshop that we've been giving privately to our clients for a number of years. A little later in a paper uh, entitled An Analysis of Front End Analysis, I characterized the process of diagnostic FEA in terms of 13 smart questions that should be addressed in every project. How many of you have ever read that paper? You can now go online and, uh, and Google uh, uh, front end analysis, and those will be uh, listed. Now, these 13 questions is one way of expressing the diagnostic uh, front end analysis model. Uh, there's another type of FEA uh, that I call new performance planning. It's used when there's a new job or new accomplishments are added. But, in terms of evolutions, in the early 80s, influenced by Tom Gilbert, I changed dramatically the way we perform front end analysis and what we taught in our workshops. From a behavior basis to an accomplishment basis. <clears throat> we reason that what is of value to an organization is what the performer produces not what he or she does, and certainly not what the performer knows. Note that an accomplishment is an output of behavior. Uh, Dr. Binder will talk uh, in a few minutes about his elegant approach to uh, accomplishment basis. Previously, <coughs> My version of performance technologies in simplest terms was this. We develop and put into place interventions called for by the front end analysis, such as work redesign, feedback, training, job age, and so forth, in order to get a, an improvement in behavior on the job. In the new paradigm, we seek to get an improvement in the accomplishments of the performer, and accomplishments are what we and the organizations value. We only value behavior that produces valuable accomplishment. So, if an accomplishment is an output of behavior that is of value to the goals of the organization, then our sequence in performance technology becomes thus. This is important, I think, because it changes the way uh, and where we start in front end analysis. In real time, we progress from left to right. One, two, three, four. But in front end analysis now, in the needs assessment, we progress from right to left. Thus, the first issue in diagnostic front end analysis is not what interventions do we want to make, but what is the organization's goal that is not being met or is new? Working right to left, then, diagnostic front end analysis that is accomplishment based approaches as approached in these general steps. We've used the diagnostic uh, model for front end analysis for many landmark projects. For example, are you aware that the worldwide eradication of smallpox, for example, is based on a massive front end analysis under the World Health Organization? Are you aware that a diagnostic front end analysis we did was with the Three Mile Island nuclear disaster? Are you aware that for part of the Army's Patriot missile program in the Gulf War, it's based on front end analysis? The breakup of AT&T creating many problems all then amenable to diagnostic front end analysis. The launch of new automobiles and many more. So where are we today uh, in, the, in this evolutionary sequence? 
As I said, we began for trying to improve training and education with program instruction. We morphed into instructional technology, then into performance technology, with FEA or needs assessment or performance analysis as its first step. Championed by such folk as the late Gary Rummer, Don Tosi, Bob Carlton, is Bob Carlton here? We just received an award. And other ISPI luminaries, the field now may be starting to be concerned with the development of an organizational improvement technology. Looking at the conference, uh, looking at the program now at the conference, it appears that there may be a few that seem to deal with organizational improvement and not just human performance. Do you agree? If you believe something, say amen. I mean, <laughs> 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 change your whole life in my next step. Okay, ready? Yay! Is it on? Yeah. <laughs> my whole life in electronics. Yeah. <laughs> I just now learned to use a telephone. <laughs> <laughs> well, the evolutions. Have we arrived at the end of our evolution? This concern with organization improvements. Have we, Roger? No, I think not. For myself, in the present day, I'm influenced by Roger Kaufman and others uh, who for many years has, have been saying that we should be about societal improvement as a whole and that our, but that our basic model of performance technology, especially front-end analysis part, and needs assessment part can be expanded and applied to societal improvement in general. Since retiring from our field in consulting, I've had the opportunity to perform an approximation of an organizational improvement project and a massive societal improvement project in my hometown, hometown of Noonan, Georgia. Let me tell you uh, briefly about uh, two projects, uh, one at the organizational improvement level and the other at the societal improvement level. First off, an organizational improvement uh, <coughs> project. In my county, just south of Atlanta, several of our larger uh, employers complained bitterly to our superintendent of education that the graduates of our schools were woefully unprepared to be productive in a variety of classes. I helped the school system in our county, pro bono, I know we believe that, <laughs> on, on a couple of uh, uh, projects previously. previously. Uh, also, the superintendent uh, knew that I was writing a book on educational reform called The Eden Conspiracy, uh, colon, Educating for Accomplished Citizenship. Uh, he asked me uh, if, he, if, if I would work with his senior staff to see what may be done about this problem. They were really beating him around the head and shoulders. Well, to make a very long uh, story short, we formed a task force of key leaders in our town, and believe it or not, I led them through an approximation of diagnostic front-end analysis given the deficient organizational goal. Following now our working backwards paradigm that I so <coughs> lucidly <laughs> we specified that these general or macro accomplishments uh, that were not being produced. The next step was to see what were the jobs in the area, uh, what skills and knowledge would be required, and based on the uh, desired specific accomplishments and the relevant behavior. Uh, notice that uh, uh, second uh, uh, desired macro uh, accomplishment. Very, very interesting to me. Uh, during front-end analysis, where we visited scores of, of employers, uh, when we surveyed, most of them talked about the need 
for a, quote, good work ethic as equally as important as the technical skills and knowledge. When uh, we probed employers on what behaviors comprise their meaning of good work ethic, they talked about such specific behaviors such as showing up for work every day, on time, and sober. Sober. <laughs> this is Georgia. <laughs> Staying on task, being efficient in performing their task, not being wasteful of supplies, not punching their supervisor in the nose, and so forth. Uh, also notice the uh, third macro accomplishment. When we looked into the learning environment that would best uh, support the relevant skills and knowledge, we decided that we needed to design a totally new educational organization. Working backwards from the overall general goal, our macro front-end analysis produced the need for a new organization. A high school with these characteristics. A curriculum, then, that was relevant to the employment needs of our county. We specified curricular paths in about 10 different areas. For example, information technology, healthcare, pre-engineering, and so forth. We recruited and worked with faculty to populate those courses with performance-based content, not based on traditional subjects. We could do this because of the latitude allowed because we applied for and was granted charter school status. The courses were designed <clears throat> to be a close approximation of the, of the activities that the students would in, ultimately engage in where? On the job. On the job, yeah. In the post-secondary world. We were able to get a technical college to establish a presence at our new charter high school. Some students graduated from high school on Friday and on Monday with a two-year technical certificate and college credit. We had instructional activities that dealt with the previously discussed work ethic items, and the students were given a separate grade and feedback on this element. Last but not least, and with some difficulty, I was able to get the superintendent of education to let us engage in faculty development. <laughs> using a modification of our accomplishment-based curriculum development system, which will be talked about. That technical high school, the Central Education Center, is now in its sixth year of operation, some of its findings. The dropout rate in our county in Georgia is about 40%. Still? The dropout rate at our school was 5%. Wow. Why? Relevant curriculum. Over 90% of our graduates either obtained jobs in the field that they've been prepared for or went on to college in the field that they had studied at the CEC. That concept is now spreading in Georgia. There are now at least uh, six schools operating in Georgia based on the CEC model. Maybe let's hope soon in Ohio. The Bill and as, as Paul said, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation named CEC one of the 30 exemplary high schools in the United States. But they didn't send any of their millions. <laughs> I'm losing my touch, baby. Now I'm I'm telling you this war story because this is a project that's a direct application a performance technology to the organizational improvement level. The second project I want to talk about qualifies, I think, as, Roger may correct me, as the societal improvement level. The Chamber of Commerce in our little town wanted to suggest changes that would be, quote, to better the community. The Chamber had watched with interest uh, the Educational Improvement Project that I had just outlined, and they asked if I would help with this activity also. Again, 
we put together a blue ribbon steering committee of about 10 respected citizens in our county. And working backwards with our paradigm, we quickly agreed that the macro goal of the project was to produce a, quote, high quality community. Very much like the discussion of the mission and vision we were talking about earlier in the Rogers session. Then we asked ourselves the question, Carl, in accomplishment terms, what is a high quality community? Didn't take long for us to agree in our Blue Ribbon Task Force these macro outputs that define the, define the goal. We then recruited a subcommittee for each of these macro accomplishments and asked them to determine the more specific accomplishments under each of these macro accomplishments. You're going to talk about level of accomplishments. For example, the health care committee produced more specific desired accomplishments. They spent a good time doing this because we had to seek out persons in the community, technical experts, who were more knowledgeable about what the criteria were. Remember, these are, are laypersons that are doing this funding analysis. For the general accomplishment, quality education, the subcommittee produced these more specific accomplishments. These are laypersons. The Land Use and Aesthetics Committee produced these more specific accomplishments. Fuzzy one. Convenient daily line. Notice that these specific accomplished define in more term and more uh, detail the general accomplishments. Given then the specific desired accomplishments, we then performed a diagnostic front end analysis for each of these specific accomplishments. About 75 diagnostic front end analysis done by laypersons, laypersons in our, in our field. And it's ultimately involved several hundred citizens. You know what they said to me? Dr. Harless, what are you getting so excited for? This is just common sense. <laughs> what was common sense? Yes. yes. Sense, not so common. Now this project is still uh, ongoing, but it might interest you. It might not interest you to see some of the more, uh, some of the societal improvement interventions the committees produce. Yeah. <coughs> there are scores of these now. For example, underway in our county in the backwoods of Georgia. As you can see, some of these examples are major interventions. For example, our new hospital will open in a couple of weeks, cost $160 million. Uh, the last one, SPLOST, is an acronym for Special Purpose Local Option Sales Tax, Tony, that we were able to fund most of these with, and the citizens voted for that. Thank you for that. Now, I, I have not driven the data self-aggrandized, didn't mean to. I'm simply trying to make the point that ours is a very powerful technology. If we use especially an accomplishment-based process, colleagues, we can produce a revolution that began with those funny-looking little books in the 60s. Organization and society need changing, and they need it now. 
One of my heroes, Margaret Mead, said, quote, do not underestimate the power of a small group of dedicated individuals who can change the world. Colleagues, if not us, then who? How will we know when the revolution is successful? Perhaps when this headline appears in better newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't mean newspapers. He didn't know me that well, and that's why. Let me get the steak again. <laughs> <laughs> so, one of the things that uh, that Joe talks about in front end analysis is about identifying accomplished performers. And so, this graph, you know, our, our first premise is that. A population of performers is normally distributed. Now along the, the base, the, the horizontal axis here, we have level of performance. That's not level of IQ, that's not years of experience, it's level of performance. And as Joe said, you know, performance is a summary term of behavior and accomplishment that has direct value to the organization. So when we look at the contributions of people in role, it does vary like this in each of our organizations. And we find that there are people who are far out to the right, star performers or exemplary performers, people who are accomplished at consistently producing value for that organization. Now, there's a, there's a delta between the peak of that first blue uh, normal curve and where that star performer is. And that gap, that performance gap, is typically underestimated. And our, our premise is that if we can go spend some time with those accomplished performers doing front-end analysis, we can leverage the insights of those star performers and leverage that to help people in the middle of that bell curve perform more like those star performers. And it's no surprise that that green shaded area is really value or return on investment that comes about, we haven't hired more people, we haven't um, 
we have equipped the existing people in the workforce who were solid performers in the middle of that bell curve and helped them shift to the right. Now, in concrete terms, one of the things I'd like to do is just share uh, two examples of how front-end analysis and this approach um, can have an impact. So this, this first example is just a simple example, one kind of vertical slice from a larger project. And it's in an oil refinery, and there are this, here we have uh, listed that there's an official procedure. There's lots of procedures. Um, this is just one. And the project was about onboarding people new to the role of being an outside operator at an oil refinery. So one procedure was slowly open valve A to allow catalyst to flow to, through valve B. On this diagram, you can see there's this tank number one. It's got this stuff. It looks like fine sand. It's called catalyst. It's about 1,100 degrees. They need to transfer it to this other tank number two. To do that, you open valve A, and it flows through the pipe through valves B, C, D, E, and F and into tank two. The procedure says opening val open valve A slowly. And so we, we had our star performer and asked, what does it mean you know, to open it slowly? Um, he said, well, you only want to open it slowly because if it flows too fast, by the time it gets to B, B's sensitive to heat, and it will melt it and ruin it. So it only needs you don't want it any hotter than 400 degrees by the time it gets to be. He said, well, how, how do you know how much to open the valve to accomplish that? Well, he said, you use an infrared gun, which sounds very technical, but it's really the same as using like an ear thermometer. Point, click, gives a reading of what the temperature is. So then we said, hmm, do all the refinery operators know this? And of course, star performers being unconsciously competent assume, well, sure, I, why wouldn't they know that? <laughs> well, valves C, D, and E were all melted and had to be replaced. So originally, there was only one valve, but each time that that valve got melted, they had to come in, shut down the line, and install a new valve. So our star performer thought about that, looked at those valves, and said, yeah, I guess not. <laughs> now, the star performer was very bright. He was former nuclear Navy. Um, he had taken courses in thermodynamics. He had years of experience in the nuclear Navy. He had years of experience in the oil refinery. And so the question becomes, how can we ensure everyone we hire into this oil refinery has that background and expertise, right? Well, pretty soon it comes, that's probably impossible. So the better question is, what would it take to get all of the refinery, refinery operators to perform this way? Well, ensure the tools are available and that the procedures have this kind of clarity and kind of a job aid format. And they can use the ear thermometer and make sure they don't melt any further valves. See, the star had come up with the solution. And we don't need to have other people, everyone else, solve the same problem. What we need to do is equip others to be able to use the same solution. The other example, and this, this kind of goes back to what Joe was saying about the ABCD, the Accomplishment Based Curriculum Development. And this project is about independent health care or independent duty corpsmen in the Coast Guard. And so in the military, in, in the services, there are physicians or doctors uh, detailed throughout. And there are also corpsmen or medics or other medical personnel who support these physicians. At smaller units, particularly in the Coast Guard, but in other services as well, there's units that are so small they don't have a physician assigned. And so the medical person, the corpsman, is independent duty. Well, the advanced training for independent duty corpsmen and medics is nine months in one service and 11 months in another service. And in the Coast Guard, the thing that initiated this project was both the cost of sending people off for 11 months at a shot 
and the availability of that kind of training. The other thing to, to bear in mind is that these independent duty corpsmen, since they're independent, there's no on-the-job training. They, when they show up, they have to be able to perform on day one. The other thing was that the available training that was very long still lacked a lot of context-specific information and, and practice for the Coast Guard Corps. Now, rather than starting with, well, let's look at an 11-month curriculum and see if we can pick and choose what might be cobbled together, we started off with a front-end analysis and produced the major accomplishments, the outputs of value that these, these IDHS people would need to be able to produce on the job. And so, if I, and I want to again take a quick vertical slice through this. So, at the top left, safe and healthy work environment, that's one of the major accomplishments that these corpsmen need to be able to produce. And so if we take that one, and we drill down, after, if you, if you think back to Joe's diagram about working backwards with the, with the FEA from organizational goal to accomplishment, next is behaviors, or tasks, or activities, the things people do that lead to these outputs. We identified for this major accomplishment nine tasks, nine different activities or behaviors that the corpsman would have to do. Number three is, that I have circled, is perform the water quality inspection. Now the water quality inspection is, so a ship pulls into a foreign port somewhere, and before taking on water in that port, this corpsman, one of their responsibilities for producing a safe and healthy work environment, is to test that water to make sure it doesn't contain bacteria or other contaminants. As we collected the information in the FEA, in the front end analysis, we look, we look this, I'm pointing at the bottom of the slide now, we look for things about how frequently do they do this, how complicated is it, what's the complexity, and what are the consequences of error if you screw up when you're doing this. Now do you think screwing up on the water sample inspection would have some consequences? Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. So, Using that algorithm, we come up with that the way to support this information of how to do this is by using a job aid with some extensive support. So they get introduction and practice using the job aid, and that's, and that's the, uh, the intervention. Now, here on the final slide, on the right-hand side, that's the water quality inspection job aid, several pages. To the left is a picture of a recent graduate from the course. What she's holding up is not a urine sample. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> not beer, but rather the job aid would tell you that after you mix the reagents, you should be able to hold it up and it should have perfect clarity. If there's any hue, yellowish hue whatsoever, it shows the presence of E. coli. So here we have an example of chock full of nuts E. coli. <laughs> Down the bottom left is the vendor bringing water to the ship who's just been informed, take it away, we don't want it. So again, the result of this project is competent, confident graduates ready to perform on day one, three and a half months total training instead of nine or 11 months, and ready to go on the first day with clear contributions to the organizational goal of health and safe workforce for the U.S. Coast Guard. Now at this point, we need to do another swap out. Swap out, yes. Swap out. If they can reverse this, they'll be ready.
you know, one of the things that, that I think about this topic, the, uh, the um, oops, I just realized I have to open up another presentation. The, uh, the sort of title of, of Joe's legacy is that any legacy, we hope, especially in a field that is evidence-based, is evolutionary. And so I think while uh, what Al had to uh, say emphasized the exemplary performance dimension of, of where exemplary performance has taken uh, this technology, uh, I want to talk about a little bit different uh, part of that lineage where I've sort of taken it, but also how it does link back very s significantly to what I've learned from Joe. Now there were some predecessors in our lineage that have already been mentioned. Uh, I was fortunate to be a graduate student with Dr. Skinner, who basically, among other things, taught me that if we approach our own behavior uh, in the same way we approach other areas of, human, of, of science, you know, with science, uh, other areas of nature, that we can significantly improve uh, things. And in the case of behavior, of course, those things might be management and therapy and instruction and so forth. And then I encountered Tom Gilbert's work in the very early 80s in his book, and then subsequently uh, the man himself, and uh, you know he brought that into the world of work, as he used to say, into the field of, uh, of, of human performance engineering. Now there's one other person I couldn't help but mention in my own lineage, uh, Dr. Og Lindsley, and many of you may not know about uh, Lindsley. He was a student with Skinner. He was an inventor of the standard acceleration chart. He was a big influence on me with respect to uh, uh, measurement. But the thing I think makes it relevant here is I had the wonderful opportunity for some years to have dinners with Dr. Lindsley and Dr. Harless, uh, often in the, uh, you know, Buckhead County here, you know, and enjoy the repartee and the learning that I was able to also pull from these two gentlemen. So I couldn't help but mention this other mentor of mine here of, of Dr. Harless. If we go back to the beginning of this thing, it all started in some respects with Skinner, with his rather obscure uh, sometimes called equation, that's a discriminative stimulus, this is the thing that comes before the behavior, and then there's the response, and then there's the reinforcing stimulus. And uh, that's kind of how, what applies in the laboratory. Now, when Gilbert came along, he actually used that framework, but because he was in what they call the world of work, what he called the world of work, he expanded that to include the dimension of what's in the environment and what's in the individual, because we were no, ta no longer talking about rats or pigeons starved to 80% body weight in a laboratory pecking a key. We were talking with humans who brought in an existing repertoire, who brought in preferences and motives for whom, you know, a given incentive might not always work, uh, who had more, as he referred to it, instruments, more in uh, our physical environment than just a simple response mechanism. And so Tom gave us a model, gave me a model that sort of blew my mind because I was living mostly down in the knowledge box doing instructional programs. But I recognized, as these gentlemen have already pointed out, that if we don't also manage the performance and the behavior of people on the job, we could do a fantastic job with instruction and frankly not make much impact. So this was very powerful for me and my colleagues in, in my first consulting firm in the early 80s. Um, and uh, we being, uh, you know, committed to the use of this, uh, found it very helpful uh, in our analysis of the work environment and our analysis of what would support or not support performance. However, when we started to have conversations with our stakeholders, with ordinary folks in the business environment, uh, it often looked a bit like this, because words like instruments were not very meaningful to them. Uh, what is that again? You know, if they were HR people, they might think it's a as, you know, some personality test. If they were engineers, they might think it's an ohm meter. Uh, you know, if we use Tom's word data, people might think we were talking about spreadsheets. So it didn't communicate well. So in the early 80s, as brilliant as this was, I started tweaking it. And I started trying out different language. And I did that for several years. And I finally got to the point where the language that we now know, and we call the six boxes model, um, turned out the sort of user test of that was that I could literally on an envelope or a napkin or a whiteboard quickly draw this thing, talk about it, uh, and frankly, on numerous occasions, come back to that person's office days or weeks later, and they might even have the napkin on their wall, and say, I've been using that, 
And they would tell me some smart thing they'd been doing with it. And I recognized we had something here because with very minimal kind of communication, people didn't make many category errors. There were lots of subtleties and lots of details that we might have to refine, but fundamentally it communicated well. And so some years later, I actually had a, 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 we didn't know what to call it then because it was no longer really Tom's model, even though that's where it started. Some years later, a now, uh, now deceased client of mine said, well, you know, you're always talking about those boxes, so why don't you call it the six boxes? So it stuck. <laughs> so that's our model, and we can spend a lot of time with it. For many years, it was just something that I used with my uh, consulting colleagues and internally with clients. But it was only maybe seven or eight years ago, or maybe ten years ago, where my partner and I looked at the kind of marketplace and looked at what was happening in performance improvement and said, you know, we've got something here. We should try to teach this more systematically and proactively to people. Because what we had was a plain English, user-tested model that really seemed to work. And even kind of spread like viruses in organizations sometimes. But in any case, to turn back to the 80s, uh, sometime in the mid-80s, I met Harless. And uh, I became accomplishment-based. Because even though I'd read Gilbert's work, and I knew the word accomplishment, and I thought it was a brilliant uh, insight that what's valuable is not the behavior, but the product of behavior. And in fact, Tom used to even point out that even in the pigeon cage, or the pigeon opera conditioning chamber, it wasn't the key tech. It was the switch closure that that key pet produced that was actually valuable and count, counted. But when I got clear on the accomplishment thing from Joe, uh, by going to his workshops and getting to know him a bit, um, I basically adopted what we now call the performance chain, which reflects the same sort of model that you saw um, in, in Dr. Harlis' presentation uh, in a more arrow-like fashion. And we slightly changed the language. Um, we found that the word accomplishment in our kind of user testing plain English mode often still got interpreted as behavior by a lot of people. And so we used the word initially output, but then we would get sort of organization level outputs. And so we came up with the word work output because it seems that people can understand that individuals and teams and even groups of people in a process produce these things and so those are work outputs. So this is the model we now call the performance chain, as I say. And one of the key pieces about it is the work output or the accomplishment. And we often talk about it as how behavior produces business results. Because the way it does it is by producing valuable accomplishments or work outputs. Now, until about six years ago, I thought everybody here at ISPI knew this. You know, because I was a student with Tom and, and then with Joe and I and, you know, hung out with people who who were accomplishment-based, but I only in the last few years have begun to realize I still think there's a minority of people in this field, in this organization, who clearly get the distinction between behavior and accomplishment. And so I hope if one thing this session might do is raise some, a little bit of interest in that approach. Because it's enormously powerful, it makes all the difference. Now we can say a lot of things about it, but one of the things that I like to talk about, I use a phrase that it, I had forgotten actually, that. Gary Rumler had a more sophisticated version of, of using this phrase, anatomy and performance. But my view is, is until you can distinguish between these elements clearly, between business results or organizational results, work outputs, behavior, and behavior influences, that it's like a heart surgeon cutting into your chest, not quite knowing where the heart, sternum, lungs, etc. are. You don't really get much traction, and you might make some big mistakes. So we, we work very hard with our clients and the people we coach to get real crisp about these distinctions. This is a very simple picture we often use, and of course the, the definition across the top reflects, I think, what we've already heard, that behavior, or excuse me, performance, is behavior producing valuable work outputs that are valuable because they contribute to business results. Now a couple of things that we've done, obviously is a picture that, you know, the output, the work output is the dart in a particular place in the, in the dartboard here which results in a score. One of the things we say about that is that those are nouns. Those are things. They're nouns. They're not verbs. And one of the things we've added to it a little bit, which is a little bit different from what I hear in the, in the earlier parts of the, the presentation today, is we talk about outputs as being countable. We think they have to be a thing that you can count like a widget coming out of a, uh, out of a process where you've got good ones and bad ones. And the reason is because we like to be able to measure them in units of countability 
but also we'd like to have criteria for good ones so we can get very crisp about expectations. And then, of course, behavior of verbs. And we often are saying to the people we coach, wait a minute, that's a verb, but you're trying to do an output there, turn it into a noun, that kind of thing. It's kind of basic, but it makes a difference. One of the other things that we've done is explored in greater detail what kinds of outputs there are, because we find a lot of people are very clear about things like deliverables or transactions. But a lot of people don't think of relationships as outputs. Uh, but I've talked to very senior executives and managers who have said, oh, among the most important work outputs in my business are relationships that I establish and maintain that meet certain criteria. Like people return my phone calls in a timely fashion. They work with me toward a joint, joint vision, et cetera, et cetera. Or people who is an output. And what I mean by that is, for example, in a customer service organization, an output for a customer service rep is pe people who say, we do business with you again. Or people who refer us to their friends. Or in training. The training program isn't the most important output. The most important output is people who can do or produce something different or better. So we kind of expanded, just again for the sake of, of folks trying to identify outputs, what we think, you know, the, the kind of categories of outputs. Um, of course, this provides the context now for the six boxes model. So now we can sort of back into the six box. You know, we, we understand now where it applies. As excited as I was early on in my career, having the performance chain, having an accomplishment base makes it really clear where it applies. One of the problems is, though, and this is sort of continuing the theme of plain English, is that HPT is awfully complicated. And although one of the things Dr. Harless has done, these are a bunch of models from one article on HPT. And they're all good. And probably many of the people in the room created some of them. <laughs> and of course, we know this one. And it's all good. But one of the things we've seen over the years is that even our colleagues, when we'll do a workshop, let's say, on the six boxes approach, I can't tell you how many times I've had people in ISPI come up to me and sort of whisper, wow, this is way easier. I'm really glad to see that because we've tried some of this other stuff and it's too complicated or our management can't go for it or it's analysis paralysis. And I also, of course, in trying to bring managers or executives who are watching their watch because they don't know how much time they want to spend with me, this ain't going to fly. So as powerful as it is for us experts and for us, for us as specialists, we've taken a slightly different approach. What we've said is, you got these two models, the performance chain and the six boxes. They're visual. There's only about 26 words in there. They're all pretty plain English. All we're really doing is deconstructing and putting it back together. Now, in our work, we usually start with work outputs. I don't usually have the opportunity to go into a company with a blank slate and say, let's figure out your business results and then design the performance. Usually. I'm given a department or a function or a process, and some performance already exists. So usually I wind up starting out trying to find those work outputs, the ones that are valuable. And then, of course, I need to confirm and understand their relationship with business results to be sure they're valuable, to be sure we shouldn't toss them out, be sure we understand that relationship in the value chain. Once we've done that, we then go find the behavior, and we try whenever we can to emulate uh, what, what, what Paul and Al talked about, exemplary performance. We try to find the exemplary performers and to, to sort out the small bits of behavior that distinguish them from the top, the average performers, so we can get best practices behavior. Then once we've got behavior, work outputs, and business results reasonably well defined, we say, hey, that's the realm for measurement. Any sensible measurement system is going to have some combination of those. Now, of course, Business results are often lagging indicators. So it's great to have those measures, but we can't make quick decisions about them sometimes. Work outputs, if we can define good ones, we can count them. And we can start evaluating those from day one, even in training, let alone on the job. And behavior is expensive to measure. We can do it for feedback, for diagnosis. So we do that sometimes. But anyway, that's the palette for us of measurement. And then finally, once we're clear on that, we go to look at the behavior influences, and we look at what's currently in place, 
We then examine what we might do to fill in the gaps or fix the negatives. And then we look to optimize it. Because we think of this as Don Tosti taught me to do, is more of a design engineering problem than a root cause analysis problem. What we think is, even if you find the glaring behavior influence that's missing or causing the problem, there's probably other opportunities for optimizing things. And so we think of this as a, a, an optimization problem as much as anything. Now, we've got a more detailed stepwise table and job aids related to this. But if we can teach folks that basically the process of improving performance involves pulling apart and putting those models back together in a way that's optimal, people can get it pretty quickly. So this whole thing that I just told you leads to a thing that we call performance thinking. It's a phrase we got from our clients, frankly. Uh, but what we mean is the following. We mean, first of all, doing what we all hope we're doing, which is analyzing and communicating about human performance in ways that are evidence-based and actionable, in ways that we can do something about. But where we maybe differ from some of our colleagues is we use those two very simple, deceptively simple, but simple models and with plain English language uh, as a foundation for this. We, we use those models and that logic to communicate not just to us specialists and experts, but across all levels and functions, from team leader to senior executive, uh, across all kinds of performance professionals, OD, HR, uh, you know, instructional design, performance consultants, you name it, they can all share this framework pretty readily. We do it with the intention of building communities of practice. In other words, one way we see this is the simplicity of these models and language lays down a foundation for people working together, no matter what their function or level of the organization. And the whole point of that is for collaboration and continuous improvement. So we want to take an organization, as we're beginning to see at some of the larger companies we work with, where it's not just the performance consultants who get this stuff, but it's the managers, the business stakeholders, the clients, so they can come together and actually jointly participate in problem solving. You know, the big vision is a kind of culture change toward performance-based culture. So that's kind of the different direction we've taken this lineage, what we call performance thinking. Now, to go back a little bit methodologically, and this is just very, you know, high level, but the first thing we got to do is find the work outputs. And a way we talk to people about that is we can do it from the organizational level down. This, for example, is a simplified rela organizational relationship map, uh, uh, courtesy of Carol Pons of Panza. And like many of you who know about that level of analysis, you know, the little boxes in there are different departments and functions. We've got suppliers and competitors. We've got target customers. We could have regulatory agencies. But all those entities, those functions, are passing around products and services and information. And we can, of course, if, particularly if we've done a good job at that and if we're working at a strategic level, be sure that's all sort of aligned. And then we can work down into the departments, teams, and even to the individual level to find our work out. More commonly, we're looking at things like cross-functional processes, where we, here's a simple swim lane diagram, where we've got multiple players, and you all are familiar with this stuff, you know, and they're all doing different things, and they're producing work outputs. So we find them in there. At the individual level, we, we use a thing that we really got from Jack Ziggin years ago, and we use it a little differently than Jack did. We call it a customer diagram. And in the middle, we have the performer, the sales director, and on the outside, we have his or her customers, which could be individuals or teams. And along the lines, we've got work outputs. Now, one of the cool things about this tool is if you teach a manager to use it with his direct reports, or if you're doing something like a new hire program or an onboarding program or a role definition that involves a single job title, you can ask those customers and get voice of the customer to define really good criteria for work outputs. Finally, these days, we're working with lean colleagues. And you might re recognize this is a, is a value stream map. This happens to be a picture that lean guys use. Well, many lean people and other process people actually don't define work outputs as clearly as we might. They have activities. But we can find them. So we'll look at their lean analysis, and we'll find the work outputs in there. One way or the other, that's what we're looking for. So we can sort of figure out where we are in the performance chain. Now what we say is, is in order to identify a work output, at least at the individual or team level, we've got to know the who, the what, and the why. We've got to know the job title or name or team, the actual performer. We've got to know 
what it is, not only the output itself, but criteria for a good one. And we've got to know what the business results are it contributes to. So one of our simple tools is what we call a who, what, why worksheet. Now this happens to be a simple process that involves four people creating a document. And we've got the account manager, the project manager, the program director, and I think an editor someplace in there. And there's a sequence of what's or work outputs with some criteria so we know what we can count as good ones. And then we make a strong effort, whether we work with managers or doing our own work, to identify the business results to which those would contribute if they were done well. Because that's what drives criteria, among other things, business results. Another example is from an analysis that was done at a big software company uh, for M2 level managers, people who manage team leaders. Now the who is all the same, so we can get rid of the who column. But what's interesting about this particular one, and you may not be able to read it, I apologize, we thought it would be a smaller room with fewer people because it was going to be two separate sessions. But what we have down the left for outputs are things like trusted cross-discipline partnership, strategic two to three year plan to develop my team, shared vision, recognized contributions to general manager planning. Now believe me, those don't show up in anybody's job description. Those are outputs which were identified through a front-end analysis talking to people who had successfully moved through this level of job. Like, what did the successful people produce in addition to their technical operational outputs? Well, for example, in this organization, the ones that really were successful produced something that was recognized at the general manager level as valuable, and they were known by name. That's an important thing to tell a new person in this job, you know? If you could do that, that would be a real important accomplishment. So we can, we can apply this way of thinking to even relatively soft, sort of typically ill-defined things. Obviously, once we identify the work outputs, then we can look at what behavior actually matters, and we can follow the kind of front-end analysis process, and if possible, with an exemplary performer approach. Uh, and of course, we can measure, as I've always <coughs> already pointed out, because now we have behavior, work outputs, and business results, and we can make decisions about what data are accessible and practical. We can make some decisions, you know, about, uh, as I said before, business results are often lagging indicators. Uh, work outputs, we think, is the, is, the, is the sweet spot. If we can get people tallying or counting good ones and bad ones, then we got something, because we can make decisions about that. And we can selectively measure behavior. We don't really have to do levels of evaluation if we've got data like this. Uh, here's a simple example from sales. The work output is, a, is an intermediate milestone in the sales process of a list of customer needs that meets good criteria. We can count them. And it contributes to sales revenue if, it fall, if the other outputs in the process are up to par. And the way to get those is asking certain kinds of questions. And we can measure and monitor all those things if we want. Here's a really simple example of a sales process identifying the key components. This is for a major output, a sales territory business plan. These are the first three or four sub-outputs or milestones in that territory goals identified, accounts classified, etc., with criteria for each of those behavior and the behavior influences, the, behavior, the six boxes factors numbered in the last column that are in place or should be in place to support that. So this is kind of a performance design document. You know, we can talk about examples where we had specific individuals uh, or job titles like project managers, customer service reps, sales reps. We focused on particular work outputs and what it would take to optimize those. We produced those kind of business results by optimizing those and accelerating those work outputs. So we can talk to people about the fact that business people get this, that if we focus on the valuable work outputs and everything needed to produce them efficiently and effectively, we can get pretty big significant results. And so with all that in mind, I just want to mention the things I think I've uh, learned from Joe. Focus on accomplishments. That's number one. That was the big thing. That's what I really learned from you, Dr. Harley. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I'll pay you a compliment. <laughs> uh, one, of the things, uh, one of the things that Joe has, and I don't think it's circulating much these days, but there's this wonderful little job aid about making soft terms hard. Now, we don't use that job aid necessarily, but we work very hard, so to speak, to make things harder, more precise, more specific, more concrete. 
And I would say some of those outputs I had on that level two manager thing are an example of that. Because what we look for sometimes is accomplishments or outputs like relationships or, and, and things of that kind that people don't even normally think of as job accomplishments, but are very important. And if you can identify those things, you can make a big difference in people's success. I learned also an important uh, lesson from Joe about how to do research and development in the private sector. When I, when I finished my graduate uh, school at Harvard's coursework, I spent 10 years in a laboratory run by a woman named B. Barrett where I learned a lot about human behavior, especially the measurement of performance of learning and fluency-based instruction and a whole bunch of stuff. But I got really clear I didn't want to go into the academic environment for a whole bunch of reasons. One of the main reasons was I wanted to expose myself to the contingencies of the marketplace because I figured it would help us figure out what to do to really make a difference. And Dr. Harless's business, and especially the Harless Performance Guild, to me, was enlightening in that regard. It helped me understand how to productize we have, what we have in a way that can be replicated and turned into a business, and also by teaching others how to do it. The Harless Performance Guild was a model that we're not doing quite the same way, but the performance thinking network, which is what we're building, is intended to be a network of pe other people who do this stuff, enabled by our products and tools. The notion of bringing other people in, into the fold. One of the cool things about it, I, I watched for years Joe and his relatively small group of people in the Harlow's Performance Guild learning with and from one another. I used to come to these conferences and there'd be a, sort of a secret meeting of <laughs> Har you know, Harlow's Performance Guild people. And one of the things we've learned is with the shared language of, of these models that I've showed you, we're learning from our clients, we're learning from our colleagues, we have this ongoing engine of discovery that's going on. It's very cool. And I think I learned that from Joe. Joe shared and does share generously, but maintains control. And that's one of the things we're trying to learn about. Because you have to maintain, it's essentially, in business, it's kind of brand integrity, it's product quality. We want to maintain the way we do these things and continue to improve it, but we also want to share it, so we're always balancing that. And of course, in general, to continue the revolution. Now, the way I think, and in my particular way, and my, my colleagues' particular way, we've continued to the revolution is, is basically, in our case, by using these simple models in plain English. Because what we're trying to do, and Joe's done an admirable job in Georgia getting a lot of plain folks doing front-end analysis using some rather sophisticated tools. We're doing another experiment, as, as Joe would say, and our experiment is using these relatively simple models and language to build sort of performance through lots of people at any level. So we like managers to be able to think this way, even if they don't write a darn thing down, but they're identifying the accomplishments or the work outputs figuring out what's needed for behavior, going through a six boxes analysis, and coming out with a plan. And at the other end of the spectrum, we'll work with people on large enterprise-wide projects applying the very same kind of analysis. So we're trying to get beyond the specialists and experts, and that's kind of my you know, momentum in the lineage of Joe Harless. And I just want to thank you, and I think we have a few minutes for discussion. that he finally understands all this stuff since Carl explained it to him. <laughs> and although I haven't been able to watch the actual output, I've been watching the activity to my left of Lynn Kearney, and I really want to thank her for her <laughs> And we do have a few minutes for questions or clarifications, and if you, I'll repeat the question and pass it on to one of the folks, uh, if, if you have any. I do want to make a comment about the first time I had gone to the job age workshop, I had the two by four applied to the side of my head. I was dislodged of all the false assumptions I had about it. instructional design being a solution that would revolutionize the world. Uh, and then maybe two years later, I'm guessing, uh, this thing came out, the accomplishment-based curriculum development model. And I thought, that's really creative. It came up with some way to use A, B, C, D. I still didn't really understand the power of being clear about the, the work outputs or the accomplishments or the results. And if 
if I thought the Job Aids workshop had an impact, understanding that single word probably was one of the most dramatic transformations in my professional life. And if any of you are spending your lives trying to improve behavior, go read Human Competence, talk with one of us, but it's really about the results that are produced, not the activities alone that produce them. Questions? Yes. Uh, for Al, uh, with the, um, the project you were talking about with the Coast Guard and reducing the amount of um, the training time by a big way, you mentioned mainly the job aids. Was that the biggest factor, or was it also the fact that you kind of got very clear on what the overall outputs were? So the question was, and I'll give it to Al, given the Coast Guard project, what was the predominant contributor to shortening the time from nine months or 11 months to three and a half months? Was it the use of job aids or the clarity around accomplishments and tasks? Thanks, uh, a short answer. Uh, it was around relevant training and job aids. And if you, if you go through the ABCD, accomplishment-based curriculum development, it's about providing plenty of practice opportunity, which at first sounds like that would lengthen the goal. We're going to have multiple practices doing this, but those multiple practices are around the things that really matter. And so by extension, the things that don't matter, that aren't linked to the outputs of value, don't need to be part of the course. So relevant and job aids. Other questions? Yes, Roger. This question is for Joe. Uh, and I, I, I'll try and answer it for him because he's uh, going back into retirement. Yes. <laughs> Ten years. Yes. The, um, it, it occurs to me, and maybe this is not a valid observation, is that first of all, if somebody was celebrating your legacy, that means you died, and I don't think that's happening. Thirty. <laughs> Thursday, maybe, it was his <laughs> uh, The other thing, Joe, points out you're still the teacher. And one of the things that you pointed out in your presentation is about going past organizational improvement to societal uh, value added. And I was wondering why all these people are celebrating your legacy and haven't moved to that day. <laughs> I don't know, Roger. <laughs> his answer was he doesn't know, Roger. <laughs> No, I, I, the only thing I want to say is I, I, I have this evolution in my head, which you know, pretty straightforward. And the only way I know is it being implemented is because my home organization is yours, and I come and I do frequent. If you when in doubt, count frequency, right? So I count the frequency of where we are in the evolution by the titles and the content of what's happening this week, and I see still a big predominance talking about training and instruction and so forth okay very very little uh, uh, on um, some but little less on performance technology and Rogers uh, in terms of organizational improvement I think there's probably out of whatever we have 70 something things here only about three that are organizational design and only yours and mine, we just talked about, are at the society improvement level. So you can't die yet. <laughs> <laughs> and when I'm through, we uh, kill you. <laughs> if I can add something to that, you know, as, as actually as we've spoken in the past or emailed, Roger, one of the things I see in my client base is more and more awareness in companies about mega, about contribution to society that they make. And while we may not be explicitly saying, you know, to uh, to a to a, you know biotech company, we're going to try to address you know how how you do a better job of saving the world from dread disease or whatever it is. It, the awareness of that is becoming clearer and clearer. And I I guess what I believe is if we can just get the accomplishment based thinking in, I think there'll be a much clearer path to that. Mm -hmm. But and and one other comment uh, uh, is that. You know, the word results and the word outcomes are very common in our community, and they're very common in the ASTD community these days, too. But I've polled a lot of groups informally on those words, 
And I don't think we use those words consistently. I think when people say results, sometimes they mean changes in accomplishments, sometimes they mean changes in behavior, sometimes they mean changes in business results. And when they say outcomes, I think the same thing is true. So I would love if we could just get clear on the distinctions between behavior, accomplishments, or work outputs, and results, be they organizational, societal, or business, and then go from there. But I don't think we've even got that discrimination very well in our community. Danny Langdon has addressed this problem with your language of work and calling for a specific uh, common language. The comment was, if you couldn't hear it, that Danny Langdon, in his book, A Language of Word, right? Is that the right Reason. wording for that? Okay. And uh, has spent a lot of time also addressing the issues of clarity of language uh, in our field. Other questions? Yes, sir. This is probably for Carl Bader, but some of the rest of the panelists may want to chime in. I find myself frustrated on a number of occasions in speaking to potential clients who seem to think that using the analogy of digital computers, that uh, speed of development and speed of delivery ultimately trump uh, the kind of, of, of careful uh, design of, of content and structure that we've been talking about here. Have you found a particular conceptual tool before that sort of brings it to a halt? Uh, the question was that clients are often so pressed to get something done, the speed of design or development, uh, they're not, I guess, receptive, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, receptive to doing the kind of work that's required. I, uh, I'll make one comment. The whole idea of analysis paralysis, we've all heard that phrase. You know, I sometimes define the front end work as collecting data for design, and it's much more palatable than saying I'm going to do analysis. Uh, so sometimes the way we position what we say uh, when we know there's going to be pushback can be critical. Also costing out whatever solution that they, as they almost invariably ask for what? Sometimes if they come to you, if you can cost out what they want to do and so forth and what is costing the organization, you very often, and you say there's opportunities now to tremendously reduce that cost or maybe eliminate it altogether, very often gets, gets their attention. But you know, the thing about it is, uh, based on your question, it assumes that what we're taking, what we're talking about takes longer than what we're doing now. You're very, we're asking the rifle-like questions and going straight to the heart. If you ever want to ever want to eat up time and you're in the training domain, uh, ask uh, a subject matter expert, what do they need to know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and six months later, you're still writing down the irrelevant crap. <laughs> well, and for those of you who've been exposed to the accomplishment-based model, when you've done the thorough analysis work, to a large degree, the design work is done, right? Because the courses are going to mimic the outputs, the modules are going to mimic the, the tasks, and the content's going to hang in that structure. And we're just loading the time. We're, yeah, so it really accelerates the overall process. Uh, you know, some of the most powerful algorithms I've ever seen are, are in ABCD, taking the outputs of the front end analysis and translating it automatically into job aids or curriculum design or work design or job descriptions, etc. Yeah, this is a kind of tangential but related comment, I think. Um, you know, I used to do good projects for companies, and when they put a lot of money on the line and it's strategic, uh, we were able usually to get things done rather quickly, uh, I think. But what I've been doing now for the last five years is coaching people inside of companies to apply stuff. And I am blown away by how many pro I mean, I've never lived in a big company myself, so I was naive. How many large projects are delayed by organizational issues, by changes in plans, by, oops, we're going to not do that this time. So if people want to squeeze time out of projects, I don't think front-end analysis is the place to do it, uh, which is one of the reasons we've started to work with some training and development performance consulting organizations to help develop their internal processes and their internal relationships with stakeholders and stuff like that. Because I think there's organizational issues that are way beyond the time required to do analysis. I saw Roger's hand first and then um, 
Roger? Uh, the other Roger, I'm sorry, Roger, Roger Chevalier versus Roger Kaufman. I just want to answer the question. I usually quote Mark Twain. Why is it that we don't have time to do it right, but we have time to do it again? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great quote. And behind Roger, there are two women, either one of you, I, I don't know who to go to first. Will these slides be on the, the they'll, also, they'll also be posted, yes. Okay. 